Chapter 1 It Ain't Where You're From I don't think this is going to be a book begging for forgiveness or glamorising crime and then saying, I learnt from it and it doesn't pay. Like any line of work, there can be ups and downs, but it's obviously one of the riskiest things you can do. The stakes are high. The rewards are high. Did I set out into a life of crime? Of course not. But like most others with a story to tell, I was born into it. In a way. I'll add that to my disclaimer. I say I was born into it because I saw my dad doing certain things. And your dad is your role model, superhero and teacher in one. Of course, observing their behaviour is going to influence you. In the environment that I was brought up in, if you never have had somebody in prison, or you never had somebody who was up to no good, you were looked upon with suspicion. That was just how it was. My dad's dad came from a broken family from the Gorbals, and lived like a large clan with extended family from the Piri, Chalmers and Paker families. Most of the family had been in prison for one thing or the other since the turn of the century, and Berlini was the end destination. When you know stuff like that, it makes you wish you'd broken the cycle. No one wants to be a fucking case study, do they? And bearing in mind that I was from Black Hill, the criminal profilers would have been licking their lips at wee Paul's beginnings and subsequent journey, high-fiving each other and saying, I told you so. You see, Black Hill was quite a place. It didn't spawn too many Oxbridge graduates, but that's not to say it was a scheme full of thickos. Intelligence comes in so many forms, and Black Hill lads had street intelligence. That's how they survived, and it's what makes the difference between winning and losing. You'll find this is the case in most crime areas and tough estates. Not many attended school on a regular basis, but they could tell you what a third of 2,560 quid was without thinking. It was different situations that we got our education from. Timing. Planning. Cunning. Care. Attention to detail. Stealth. Keeping a low profile and sharing the profits was what made a successful blag at a jeweller's, and being around to learn and hone your skills rather than an unplanned smash and grab to either get caught legging it or a day later when you're flashing the cash. Black Hill was commissioned and redeveloped from Wasteland to a new housing scheme and was built as a council estate in the 1930s. It was basically all about rehousing and getting rid of the slums from the 19th century to form newer ones. For example, in 1935... Nearly half the population of Black Hill was made up of rehoused tenants from the overcrowded Garngad district to the west. Constraints in funding meant there was no real opportunity for aesthetic refinement in architectural design. Grenfell, anyone? And things like shops and public transport were lacking. In short, it was a bit of a hole. It was built without much thought to how it looked because, in their eyes, it was just to house the slum dwellers, and they'd not give a fuck about where they live. The notion was that Black Hillians were lacking in qualities of responsible citizenship. It stigmatised the community. The message that was projected was that we weren't worth spending money on because we wouldn't know what decent housing and quality of life was. The place was always going to be stigmatised from the word go. It always happens, though. The state of the living conditions portrayed in Our Friends in the North was no different to any other brutalist shite that was thrown together under the guise of progress. And what has all that concrete been pulled down to make way for? New build shite, with paper-thin walls and rooms you can't fit beds in, and garages you can't fit a car in. Black Hall was named as such because that's apparently where they buried people from the city who died from the Black Flu in 1918 so they took them away from the city to bury them up there in a mass grave, and then they built a fucking estate on top of it. That poltergeist revelation and the poor conditions just made residents, or tenants as they'd refer to us, 
No, they were always going to be on the shitty end of the stick. It was in the late 1920s and 30s that razor gangs appeared amongst the youth of Glasgow. If you thought it was confined to the 1960s, then think again. The Glasgow gangs in those more recent years were probably more violent than the first wave, but it still must have been a fucking tricky time to be a kid back then. I mean, I'm trying to sound shocked just to give some sort of moral balance. If you know me, you know I'd have fit in well back then, and would probably have been leading the charge. The Glasgow Evening Citizen listed 24 gangs operating in the city during the 1920s and 30s, And I've heard the media, the fucking media, say there were six times more gangs in Glasgow at one point than there were in London. And London is ten times bigger than Glasgow. So you do the math and all that. What it all means is that there's been a fuckload of NEDs, non-educated delinquents, slicing people up for near enough a hundred years. Alexander MacArthur and H. Kingsley Long wrote all about the Razor Gangs in their novel No Mean City, published in 1935. So we were nothing new. Gangs will always exist in certain areas, and we were all just part of the life cycle. It's no different now than it was all the way back then. It's just that the clothes are a bit different. After the war, before I was born, there were improvements to the area, but this was still in a state of around 1,500 houses, in a small area. So it was overcrowded and experienced all the social problems we now know emerge from such places. The negative image continued to dog Blackhill until the late 20th century. I mean, think of an area near you that's been done up. Even if parts have been flattened and new builds are up, it's still the same place. It still has the same reputation. Memories are long. It takes a while for somewhere to re-establish itself. I asked the Googles about Black Hill not too long ago, just to check when it had been built. You know, so my facts were correct and all that. There isn't much on the wiki page to retell other than... There was, and is, a strong sense of neighbourliness, partly encouraged by the enclosed nature of the site, due to industry railways and main roads cutting it off from other districts. It was, however, built close to a gasworks and a distillery, which did not add to the health of the area and, perhaps for this reason, it gained a reputation for being difficult to let. Nearby is a prison, H.M. Prison Bar Linney, which may also have encouraged negative evaluations of the area. The area has been comprehensively redeveloped in recent years, with much of its housing stock having been demolished and replaced with improved stock. It goes without saying, really. There is generally a sense of community in such places. The older folk seem to enforce that more, and the younger generation never seem to see it that way. Wiki then goes on to say that a recent community survey reported residents' concerns were similar to those in other urban areas. In the last issue, we reported the findings of a local survey that helped to pinpoint the top ten priority issues for the neighbourhood. Things like road safety, litter and vandalism, dog fouling, dumping and youth disorder all featured strongly. It seems there's more to write about me than there is about all of Black Hill. I take that as an honour. So it didn't sound like there was ever that much change in Black Hill, from when it was built to when I arrived in the world. Youth disorder, as they call it, I just think will always exist in areas that are less well-off than others. Criminals don't usually come from well-off areas, because there's no reason to. You don't join a gang in a posh area because there's nothing to rebel against. It's all good. What's to go rage for? But the kids... It's not like they'd smash Black Hill up all the time. It's just they'd get together and do whatever it was that gang mentality suggested. There was no science or master plan behind any of it. It was about territory. 
It was recreational violence, not for profit. Stuff didn't go on for any other gain than to better a team who were on your patch, not to nick a watch or a wallet. That's probably what the police could not understand. In their eyes, there had to be a higher reason behind it all. In a way, yeah, kids were raging against the machine. But in fairness, it was just groups of kids defending their own streets, seeing off their rivals. If you weren't from that street, why the fuck were you walking through it? There were instances where you'd have one gang at one end of a street and a gang based down the other end. You'd have a no-man's land in the middle. In digging around, I found this piece from the Glasgow Herald in January 1968. Within the present confines of Glasgow, there are the remains of the villages engulfed by the city in its extremely rapid expansion since 1830. Some villages remain in name only, such as Gorbals, Anderston, Partick and Mary Hill. The trouble is that the growth of Glasgow has dehumanised many of these villages. The spread of the tenement swallowed up street after street, regardless of whether this was the main street of the village, and equally regardless of the buildings, the church, the castle or the prison, which had to be destroyed to make space for them. In Glasgow at present, there are many ordinary tenemented streets, no different from the countless others, which at one point were the main streets of villages. The beautiful and romantic Kelvin is now overgrown with weeds and surrounded by rubbish. The neat village has a trunk road running through its centre. The old houses overlooking the main street are blacked, bricked up and ruinous. The canal is concealed behind walls and hoardings, and the view over the hills is obscured by dingy streetlights and disfigured by waste and derelict ground. Up to a point, I never really saw myself or our family as a typical Black Hill one. We weren't. We lived at the top end and had a pretty stable setup. We weren't well off as such. We didn't have a butler, but weren't on the bones of our arse either. I dare say if it wasn't for the pull of Black Hill, I'd have lived a pretty average and unassuming life. But we know that was not the case. Black Hill was of its time. Of course, the press slowly caught on to the gang culture. Stories on youth disorder first started appearing in the papers in the 50s and 60s, but it was probably the mid-60s when it seemed that's all that was going on. There was one headline from 1965 that proclaimed The gangs are back when the slashings, group disorders, vandalism and lawlessness appeared rife. It got so bad in Glasgow that vigilante groups formed in Easter House in the East End in 1966. It all died an early death when the senior magistrate for the city declared that anyone taking the law into their own hands would be treated like any other transgressor of the law. After a rethink, a group of dozens of shopkeepers got together and roped their local MP in to tackle the problem, and an anti-teenage gang committee was formed by the Lord Provost and the Chief Constable. It gathered momentum and got recognised in the national news where phrases like stabbings are no longer news in Glasgow were bandied about. Crime figures at the time revealed that 850 people had been arrested for carrying an offensive weapon and over 1,500 had been done for breach of the peace, with around the same done for disorderly behaviour. There were well-known gang names I remember from growing up. They had names like the Black Hill Toe, the Provy Young Team, and the Provy Rebels. Thing is, with Glasgow, it's a fucking tough city. It always will be. I grew up with two older sisters, Kath and Carol, and an older brother, Billy. I was the bairn until my youngest sister, Maureen, was born. When I said earlier that I was born into this darker world, I actually was fucking born there, right in the bedroom at 19 Hoganfield Street, on 10th of November, 
1963. My dad, Willie, worked as a bus driver, and Jenny, my mother, was a housewife. These days you'd say she was a stay-at-home mum, but neither of those tags are accurate or sum up the extent of the job description. To mum, I was her blue-eyed boy. Even if I did something wrong, my mum always, you know, she didn't bury her head in the sand, but she'd always take the idea that it wasn't me first. She did that all her fucking life. Even if I was wrong, I don't think she would have said anything against me. But I never put her in that position. She was an honest woman, and if you did anything in front of people like that, then you deserved everything you fucking got. She was brought up in a devout Catholic household. She would never tell lies to anybody, including the police, much to my dad's amusement, which he found out the hard way as well. She just didn't know how to lie. Anything at all to do with me, she always complied with the cops. If you know somebody is liable to give you up for whatever you've done, then don't talk about it in front of them. You were asking for it. Like everyone else, Mum and Dad moved to Blackhill from the Garngad, which was like a dumping ground for Irish immigrants. My mum came from the McGinty clan, but she met my dad at the ballroom. For my dad to go somewhere like that, and to where my mum was from, it was just like fucking two polarised positions. Almost impossible to imagine it happening. They must have really loved each other, eh? My peers probably thought of me as leaning more towards middle class, or as middle class as you could be in that area. This is where we were less typical. My dad had work as well as morals, and was a self-starter with his own legitimate business. He had a work ethic. Most of my mates lived in the middle of Black Hill, and didn't have that kind of influence on their life. I don't mean that anyone from a broken home was never going to amount to anything. That old stigma is well past its sell-by date. I mean, when you see someone getting up on a morning to do some honest graft to put food on the table, you see from an early age what it is to be responsible and look after a family. And I'm not being a hypocrite here either. I'm not about to say that it put me in good stead to go straight into regular work and knuckle down to that way of life. Whichever path I would take, or whichever path chose me, having my dad there gave me someone to look up to. The family still lived by Black Hill codes, though. Don't let anyone get away with anything. Look after your own and never involve the police. Having the police at your door was bad for a family reputation on so many levels. With my mates living in the middle of Black Hill, that's where I'd spend a lot of my time. The middle of Black Hill meant you were right in the thick of it. We'd knock around there on a night and at weekends. It wasn't salubrious at all. This was the rougher part, where the lawlessness was. This was where you had to be tough to survive. Gangs of teenagers didn't just sit around on a wall smoking and sharing a bottle of blue WKD. If you walked past, you were on their turf, and you'd get a severe kicking, maybe hospitalised, sliced up, whipped with a bicycle chain, stabbed, anything. And this wouldn't be a robbery or mugging. There was nothing to nick off anyone. It would be a vicious attack because you were there. That's how it was. If you didn't belong, weren't streetwise or tough, you were fucked. Everyone carried a knife, and everyone was looking for an excuse to use it. So I had the regular life on one side, and the more criminal or violent life on the other side of the estate. There was a balance, but if you're inclined to it, the bad stuff could drag you down and upset that balance. For a youngster... It was like being on an adventure in a forest, but going too far into the thick woods where the environment soon changed for the worse, and before you knew it, you were lost in the darkness. It was all black streets dimly lit by pale orange lighting. 
the ubiquitous broken glass, empty beer cans, bottles and bits of housebrick laying around that were either left behind after a battle or could be used in one. Any wooden fences that remained round gardens were just dirty sticks. Fences were either used in warfare or knocked down so you could run freely from one end of a street to the other. The gardens they were supposed to protect and keep as part of a property were trodden into mud. Most shop fronts and walls were graffitied to fuck. Standard. Going back to crimes committed, this is probably where we have this opinion of community. People didn't steal from each other. It was one of those unwritten rules. The phrase, you don't steal from your own, should be suffixed with something like, because they've got nothing to steal. You do hear this being said a lot when the good old days are discussed. You could leave your door open and all that. Anyone stealing from neighbours would soon be found out, and community punishment would be dished out. I only really heard of snowdroppers doing it, low-life scum who'd steal clothes from washing lines. In a place like Black Hill, clothes were hard to come by, as it was difficult enough to keep your head above water. It was a personal thing to do to a family, and it was the mums who got to dish the punishment out if a snowdropper was caught. It was the mum's job to deal with washing and hanging clothes out, so anything like that was a personal slight on them, and they were not to be fucked with. That was a big reason for never bringing the police in on anything. Firstly, there were no secrets in Black Hill. Everything that happened was known about. This was another reason for not committing crime against thy neighbour. If you stole from someone, there'd be a lynch mob at your door before you got home. We could deal with trouble ourselves. The police added an extra level of complication to a situation. They were never liked in areas such as ours, and they were never wanted or needed. It was almost like they were offended by that. They were certainly imposing on us any time they were there. A friendly, yeah right, copper saying hello to you on the street could get you done over for being on their side. If anyone did go out on the rob, it would be out of the area. Hitting a shop on the estate was just counterproductive to the community's needs. Doing a blag away from home meant you could return as a hero and spread the wealth. <laughs>